on this wonderful Sunday morning, and uh, I believe God's going to do some great stuff in this house today, amen. Let's all go to the Lord in prayer this morning that God would have his way. Wonderful Savior, we know that you're still on the throne. God, we've come into this service for you, and we pray, oh Lord, to walk the way you want us to walk, to move the way you want us to move. Uh, We pray, God, today that you would pour out a fresh baptism of conviction. Lord, that you would help us today, oh God to walk the way, God, you want us to go, uh, to do what you want us to do. Uh, We pray for you to have your divine will and purpose in this service this morning. Lord, we exalt your name. Uh, You are worthy beyond measure. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. And amen. Welcome one another to the house of the Lord this morning. Shake hands, fellowship, and worship with the praise team as they come and sing.
Hallelujah. Can we give a hand clap of praise? Podemos darle un fuerte aplauso al Señor Jesús esta mañana. Oh, hallelujah. He is worthy. Él es digno. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, can we give another hand clap of praise? Can we praise him this morning? If you are thankful, can you praise him this morning? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a beautiful presence of the Lord this morning in this house. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can you just lift up your hands one more time? Can you praise him? Can you tell, can you tell him this morning how thankful you are? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Gracias, Señor. Porque tú has sido muy bueno conmigo, Señor. Thank you because you've been so good to me. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Gloria sea el nombre del Señor Jesús. Ooh, I feel good. I'm speaking Spanish this morning. Hallelujah. This morning, remember when I pray for our life recovery program and those that are involved, that the Lord anoint them and use them in a mighty way. And those that are attending for the Lord to do our work in their lives. It's already started. The moment that they walked in into that class, I believe that the Lord started working in their lives. Amen. Let's remember our city. Our city. Don't you love Ayuka? I love Ayuka. And that's what I want. God, God, I want God to do great things in this place, in this city. Of course, our bishop and uh, Sister White as well, their children, and their grandchildren. I'm not saying that because you're here, but that's how I believe it. And of course, our nation. Our pastor, Mama Lambert, and their children and the grandchildren and their family as well. And there is anybody here with me. I was this uh, thinking this morning, and um, you know the Bible says, "If any man is thirst, come to me. If you're thirsty, you can come and drink from the water." Of course, you have a bottle of water right next to you, but I don't think that's what he's talking about. He said, if this week has been hard on you or anything's going on in your world that makes you tired, you don't know what to go, I, I can tell you Jesus is here. And he's here to quench your thirst. And I'm glad that this church cares for you and we care for your needs and we care for what's going on with you and we want to pray with you and for you this morning. Hallelujah. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that the Lord can touch you this this morning. Brother Skirk can say something last night. It might not be like living different or some, the problem might not be a gun, but the Lord will give you peace. It will be a peace that surpasses all understanding. And we lift up our hands this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We praise you. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. I thank you, Lord, because you're such a great and awesome God, oh Lord. I come before your presence, oh Lord. Toca, Señor, en esta mañana. Toca, Señor, con tu poder y tu gloria. Oh, Señor, quita nuestra sed de nuestras vidas en este día. Oh, Señor, el cansancio que este mundo nos da. Oh, Señor, los problemas que este mundo nos da. Oh, Señor Jesús, yo confío que tú nos puedes tocar. Oh, Señor, y saciar esa sed, Señor. I know, oh Lord, that you oh, can quench the thirst that this Lord have given us. Oh, hallelujah hallelujah the problems and situation oh lord you can quench that thirst this morning 
Oh Lord, I pray this morning uh, in the powerful name of Jesus. Uh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I declare victory this morning. I declare healing this morning. I declare provision this morning. I declare salvation this morning in your precious name. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Can you somebody give a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to come. If you need any, any, any need of prayer, I'm going to ask you to come and let the minister pray for you.
to come. I'm not one for sneak a preach. Not one of those types. But I feel something that has been heavily upon my spirit since the beginning of this service. The thing that separated King Saul and David in their mess ups and their mistakes it wasn't the fact that Saul was disobedient. It wasn't the fact that David was disobedient. The thing that separated them is when the man of God came and said, you did this. The difference was Saul tried to blame everybody else for his problems and refused to acknowledge and be humble and acknowledge the fact that he had messed up. But David, when the man of God put a finger in David's face, he said, it was me, God. I did it. I'm the one that made the mistake. I don't have a clue what's going to be preached across this pulpit today. But if God speaks to you, it's not somebody else's fault. We've got to learn. If we're going to go anywhere with God, it was me, God. I messed up. I made the mistake. I did it. I've got to change. There is a presence of conviction that has set down in this service right now. I have seen it moving upon the people of God. And it's already moving in this service. And God is moving. And God is trying to touch hearts. And He's trying to help today. And we need to allow Him to help us to move into the next stages of revival. Because if we ever want to go anywhere with God, we got to get the flesh and the carnality of man out of the way and say, it was me, God. Help me to change and be better than I've ever been. Let's pray this morning. 
I know that we normally have a prayer, but let's just pray this morning over this offering and over this service. Oh, God, we pray today that you would bless hands that give, that you would bless, oh, God, in abundance and pour out, to, oh, God, mightily. But today in this service, God, I pray that more than financial blessings, God, more than anything, I pray for a heart change to move today, that you would bless with conviction, that you would bless with salvation, that you would move with the presence of glory, oh God, that you would move with the presence of deliverance in this house, to move upon us, your people, oh God, and show forth your mighty mercies, oh God, we need you, we need you, oh Lord, I pray today that each of us would surrender everything, oh God, in your presence. Bless your mighty name, Jesus, as you come worship with the praise team, as you come this morning and give, but come with your heart open. Come with your spirit intertwined with his. Let's worship him today. the whites coming out we should lift our hands and see the atmosphere right now come on lift 
Lift your hands, lift your voice. I need an Elijah to see the atmosphere for a moment. I need a Daniel to see the atmosphere for a moment. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. What a great atmosphere we feel here this morning. I feel the Spirit of the Holy Ghost moving upon us. I am anticipating great things this morning. Anybody excited about what God's going to do? To all of our guests that are with us today, thank you so much for joining us. To all the home folk, thanks for doing what you're supposed to do. Thanks for being here. I told Pastor this morning that I feel like we have tapped into a supernatural element and into a depth of the Holy Ghost that has been a little while since I felt when I was here. And... Uh, I'm not saying it hasn't been here, just I haven't been here when this avenue was opened up. And I am believing God to speak yet again this morning and to help us give us some clarity and some direction. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1, the Bible says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The king of heaven, kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. And again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their way, one to his farm, and another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden are not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, in as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He had no excuse as to why he was not ready for the marriage. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. We love to preach that last little verse there. Ooh, we will preach it. As long as you'll sit there and listen. But we fail at times to, 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 to put it right after the judgment of God. I want to preach today to the heart of this congregation. I'll preach to some guests and some new converts who you've allowed there to be some room for options and opportunities. I'm going to preach today to some established saints and to some people that have been coming around this church for a year or so now. I'm going to preach to you about ignored invitations. Ignored invitations. God is going to speak to us again today, much like He moved in this place last night. 
If you were not here last night and you could have been, I'm preaching to you. If you were not a part of some things and you could have been, I make no bones about it. I'm coming for you today. Would you lift up your hands, lift up your voice, and ask God to touch one more time right now. Come on, let's ask God to let the Holy Ghost begin to sweep through this congregation. Open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to begin to hear the word of the Lord. somebody say let's preach with him you can be seated the introduction to Matthew chapter 22 is the continuation of Christ's teachings in the temple these teachings are found to be somewhere around two to three days before the betrayal and the death and the crucifixion of Christ due to the timing of these teachings there is a particular weight and power that comes with the recordings of the book of Matthew and the Gospels and this time frame in the Gospels, there's a weight that comes with it because they understand these are some of the last lessons that Christ will teach before He is buried and before He is ascended and and glorified into heaven. Matthew chapter 22 and verses 15 through 22 He speaks concerning paying tribute to Caesar. He said that which is Caesar's is Caesar's. And and, and, in verses 23 through through 33, he speaks of the resurrection of the dead. Verses 34 through 40, he, he speaks of the great commandment of the law. And then in 41 through 46, he places an emphasis on the relationship of Christ or or the relationship of the Messiah to that of King David of the Old Testament. But the purpose of this message, we need to narrow our focus down to just verse 1 through verse 14. We see here the parable of the guests that had been invited to the wedding. The king has announced the marriage of his son. We must see from the onset of this message that the king here is God and he is a great king. There, there is no other king like this king. He, he is the king of kings and the king has prepared a marriage for his son and the spirit of God robed in flesh is the Son of God. There there is no Jehovah Junior, but it is the Spirit of God from heaven robed in flesh and dwelling on earth. We understand that this does not give a separation of the powers. Rather, the Son is the fleshly representation of the Spirit of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. The son is Jesus and and we are the bride. He is the bridegroom and we are the bride prepared. It is imperative that we understand that the word of God is speaking about the marriage between Christ or the Messiah and the church. It is a marriage between the supernatural being and and the deity of our Lord and Savior and those that are believers and that have been born again of water and spirit. Christ was speaking of the festivities that would come with the marriage to the bridegroom. There was going to be a feast like they had never seen before. The king was excited to see the union of the son and the church. He had everything planned out and ready to go for 
the guests to enjoy. He made sure that there was more than enough feast to eat on. He had planned out every detail of the day. Imagine if you can. I know there's going to be a marriage here in a couple weeks. She's probably been planning that marriage since she was about six years old. But can you imagine the detail that, that we put into a marriage? But Christ seems to put an emphasis on every single detail. Everything was ready. The dinner was prepared for the marriage. In other words, all the privileges that come with being a part of the church was laid out and ready to be partaken of. All the blessings that would come with the new covenant and with the marriage of the bridegroom, it was the forgiveness of sins. It is the favor of God. It is the peace of mind of knowing I am not doing this on my own, but I am a part of the church. It was the promises given to the believers. It was the power to overcome a bad past. There is a confidence for our future. There is no experience like the new birth experience. There's no feeling like knowing that you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's nothing in this world that feels as good as repenting of your sins and giving your life to Jesus. Having your spirit filled with the Spirit of God is greater than anything you can ever there is nothing, there is nothing like being baptized in Jesus' name. When we are baptized in Jesus' name, all of our sins are washed away. Your past is erased. You get a fresh start when you are born again. As the scripture instructs you, you become a part of the family and the body of Christ. I want to stop here for a moment and tell everyone under the sound of my voice that there is nothing, there is no life like being a part of the church. There is nothing in this world that will be as fulfilling as being a part of the church. When I'm a part of the church, I have access to the throne of grace. When I'm a part of the church, I have a hope of an eternal life. When I'm a part of the church, I get the hope of heaven. When I'm a part of the church, when I get weary, I can come to church even if I was an orphan. When I've got the church, I've got a family. I've got brothers and I've got sisters. I got moms and I got dads. When you're a part of the church, you're a part of the family. You belong to the body. There is nothing... Oh, I'm burdened this morning to convince you there is nothing like being a part of the church. You can ask anybody that's ever been a part of the church and then walked away. And if they are honest with you, they'll tell you, I missed the church. I didn't just miss the building, but I missed the people. I missed my friends. I missed my family. We may not have been related by body biological standards but we are born again we are brothers we are sisters we are family we're the body of Christ the call and the offer to the gospel and to be a part of the church are seen as an invitation to the feast. Those that were bidden to the feast were the Jews. We must see that wherever the gospel is preached, there is an invitation that is given. I must remind you here at this point in this message that the ministers of the gospel are the servants that were sent out to invite the guests to the wedding. They were sent to invite them to the feast. And now that everything is in place, now 
now that the sacrifices have been made and preparation is in the place it's supposed to be, now that the necessary things are in order, the king sends his servants to invite the guests. The guests are called. They are bidden to the wedding. To all that are within hearing distance is the invitation extended. Notice with me that there were no names printed on the invitations. There were no specific names or family or creeds printed on fancy papers and placed in envelopes. There was no reason to do all of that since no one was excluded. But those who would exclude themselves know the king just sent servants out to make sure that the people were invited to the church. He sent servants out to give yet another invitation to be a part of the body. Hear me, it's here that something something troubling happens at verse 4. You see the invited guests did not come to the feast as the king anticipated. And so as the king attempts to bring the people in and feed them, he sends out more servants, keeping in mind that the servants are a type of the ministry, knowing that every time your pastor stands behind the sacred desk, he is extending another opportunity. Every time the evangelist stands behind this pulpit, they are extending yet another invitation though that to those that would hear the words, come and be a part of the party. Come join the feast. You need to be a part of the body. You need to eat and be merry. Why don't you join the festivities of the church? Can't you hear the voices of the servant messengers? Come to church. Come be a part of the body. Come be a part of the festivities. Come to the party. Why don't you get involved in the church? It's not enough to hear the joyful greetings. You got to be a part of the church. It's not enough to hear the testimonies of everybody else. You got to be a part of the body. You got to be a part of the church. The king sends out more servants. They had been sent priests of the wilderness. They were given prophets in the kingdoms. In a desperate attempt, he sent yet another level of ministers called servants. When the prophets of the Old Testament were unsuccessful, John the Baptist couldn't get them to listen. Even Jesus Christ himself tried to tell them that the entertainment and the festivities were ready when he told them that the kingdom of God is at hand. And yet, sadly, they still would not come. They were the chosen people, yet they ignored the invitation sent from the king. They were the proof, excuse me, they were the people for whom miracle signs and wonders were performed and yet they still would not come to the party understand with me the reason that so many people do not accept the invitation is not because they cannot rather because they will not Mind you, I'm not preaching about people in the world. I'm not preaching about people that have never heard about the name of Jesus before. I'm preaching about people that are around the church, but they never accept the invitation to be the church. I'm talking about those people who claim to be the people of God. Those paid people that enjoy living in the kingdom, but you have not prepared yourself to enter the temple. Those people that are content just being within hearing distance of the master's house. We grow content just being within eyesight of what the king is doing at the festivities. It wasn't bad enough that they ignored the invitation, but some even made light of it. They didn't see the need in it. They didn't see the worth in the invitation. Come on now. You've all seen people like this. They thought the messengers made more out of it than it really was. Hear me loud and clear when I tell you today that too often we cater to our own carnality and we show our spirit spiritual laziness by assuming that the preacher is making more of the situation than is necessary. How many times have you heard someone say, well, I just don't think it's that big a deal. I don't think it's quite as important as pastors trying to make it out to be. I just don't think it takes all that. I don't think it's necessary. It's just one service. It's just one week missing church is all. 
Now, mind you, before that critical spirit raises your head, I'm not talking about vacations. I'm not talking about taking time to spend with your family. I understand you got jobs. I, I understand you need vacations. You need to rest. I'm talking about the chances you could be here like some of you could have been here last night, but you chose otherwise not to be. It's just one unholy environment. I can hand, it's, just one, it's, it's just that I don't get along with all the other young people. I just don't have anything in common with that church. It's just, it's just too crowded at those events. Watch what verse 5 says. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. The Gospel of Luke gives us the, the, the very same parable, only the terminology is a bit more detailed as, they, as to why they ignored the invitation. Luke 5 verses 18 through 20 says, And they all with one consent begin to make excuse. It didn't say they gave a good reason. It didn't say they had valid reasons. They could. It says, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. Luke called them out for what they were. There are a bunch of excuses. The Bible says, the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must needs go see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I've got to go prove them. I pray have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Here we see the reasons they give as to why they couldn't make it to the feast. They made light of the invitation because they had other things that they were more concerned with and they thought they had to go do. Perhaps the saddest part about stagnant churches made up of complacent people is that sin is not our primary danger. I've been around this long enough. I've been in ministry long enough to recognize Brother Patrick, sin is not our real problem. Falling short of the mercies of God is not our real problem. You want to see a church fall flat on its face and become stagnant and become mediocre at best? It's not just a sin problem. It's not that there's fornication. It's not that there's pornography and adultery. It's not unholiness. It's not disobeying the standards of the church. Sadly, the chief danger of our modern church it's not television it's not drugs and alcohol the biggest danger that we as the Christians face is the fact that we allow ourselves too many options the biggest problem that the people of that city had is they simply had too many other things they would rather go do than be a part of the church They had too many other things that they could do and still feel okay about missing the party. Luke tells us that two had bought things and were in such a hurry to go see what they had purchased that they had no time to even consider the invitation that had been sent by the king. One had bought property and his mind and heart was so fixed on enlarging his worth that there was simply no time for the party. There was no time to go to church. I've got too many things I've got to do. He could have gone and seen the property the next day. After all, it wasn't going anywhere. No, rather, he decided to ignore the invitation and chose the options in his world before faithfulness to the kingdom of God. Another had purchased oxen. He has to be excused so that he could go and make sure that his purchase was worth the price that he had paid. Never stopping long enough to consider the price that he would pay for ignoring the invitation to be a part of the church. Luke speaks of the newlywed that, said, that stated, I cannot go to the feast when in reality he could have gone. He just didn't want to. The feast had lost its importance. The feast didn't. Let's just be honest with each other here today, okay? By law, according to Deuteronomy 24 and 5, every newlywed was dismissed from battle for the first year of his marriage. It was understandable and permissible. However, to be excused from battle is not the same as dismissing the invitation to feast and fellowship with the church. Why didn't the new groom just bring his wife along? Let's be honest. Caleb, I'm going to mess with you for a second. You've been married for a little while now, but when you first got married, there were some meals you ate at the house you would have rather eat at mom and dad's don't look I've been newlywed before I'm gonna be honest I can say this right now because my wife will be here next week I ain't got she ain't giving me the eyebrow right now we first got married my wife couldn't cook her way out of a wet paper bag she didn't know what she was doing there was a reason that we had family night at mama's house it's because wife couldn't cook <laughs> now 
I can say this because mama ain't here. I just soon eat Aaron's cooking than I would my mom's. But let's let's be honest, Jesse. You've been married for a few years now. You got like 14 kids or whatever, and so I mean. <laughs> But the reality is, Dosha, you'll even admit, I probably couldn't cook that good at the beginning. There were some nights you would have rather, let's face it, there is no meal like could have been eaten at the king's house. You would think, oh, help me now, I got to hurry, I cannot stay here for too long. You would think that if anybody would understand the importance of a marriage supper, it would be the newlyweds. If anybody's going to understand the excitement of somebody coming to a marriage, it would be those who had just been married. They understood the excitement. They understood the anticipation of the union. They understood the great things that come at the marriage ceremony and the feast and getting to be a part of it. The problem was not that they couldn't go. The problem was not that he couldn't make it. The problem is that he had too many options that he would rather do. He forgot what it was like to be a new convert and need the church. They had forgotten what it was like to be lonely and afraid and need the people of God. So rather than bring somebody else to the temple and bring somebody else to the church, it gets real easy just to be comfortable. It gets real easy just to sit back and say, well, they're just making more to do about that than there really is. No, you have just found too many options. You've just found too many things that will take up place. Hear me right now in the Holy Ghost. It's not like they were sinning. No, they just ignored the invitation to be involved in the church. They placed an emphasis on the things of momentary fulfillment instead of the soul. They placed their importance on time spent with things rather than where they would spend eternity. The farmer could go home to his large estate, his big house, and eat his own meal. After all, I don't need anything. How long has it been since you needed God? <laughs> we, we are so self-sufficient nowadays. When's the last time that you didn't know where the next meal was coming from and you needed God? The storekeeper had enough money. He'd go buy his own meal. He didn't need God. He didn't need, the, Leanne, he didn't need the marriage supper. Because if I don't eat there, I'm just going to go buy what I need and I'm going to do it myself. When's the last time you didn't have that good job? When's the last time that you didn't have to work so many extra hours that it was easy to excuse why you couldn't come and be around the church? The newlywed was going to go home and eat a meal that his wife had cooked. In their minds, they didn't need the marriage supper. They didn't have to accept the invitation to go to the king's house and feast. They could eat all they wanted to at their own home. They had no valid reason why they could not feast, so they just made up excuses. We don't need the church. We don't need God. We don't need that. We, we can find our own way. We can figure it out for ourselves. We we don't need anything else. Sadly in our modern Christianity and with all the conveniences of church we think we can do just as well at home. We think we can feast sufficiently at home rather than coming to the party. That's that's why you'll stay home and justify it by saying well I watched on live stream I'm just not, I got a runny nose no you could come to church but you can excuse your laziness by just staying at home and saying I'll watch on live stream you'll miss multiple services in a row and justify it by claiming to be spiritual enough to handle it well that went over like a wet blanket You'll excuse, you'll excuse yourself from being involved in the church and blame it on how busy you are. And yet you have time for any and all hobbies that you have. But you can't be committed to one single department in the church. You can't be involved in outreach because I've got I'm just so busy. But you ain't got no problem running and gunning on the weekends and spending all the time and all the money you want on your hobby. I'm not preaching against hobbies. I love to fish. I love to hunt. I love to golf. I love to try. I love all of it. But what I'm saying is at any point that it takes precedence over your walk with God and it takes precedence over the invitation to be a part of the body, it becomes a sin. You can come up with a thousand excuses why you won't be involved with the rest of the church and with the rest of the youth group, but you have no problem spending hours upon hours with people that influence you negatively. Oh, 
Oh, Lord. Now I'm going to start moving because them daggers will be harder to hit me. All I got to do is take one look at some of your social media and I can tell what kind of people you're hanging out with. (laughs) That's why some of you, you won't follow people from the church. You won't let pastor and them follow you because you don't want them to see what you're involved in. I was preaching at a church one time. I had been there for a long time. Probably one of the longest revivals. Y'all think y'all got it bad? Y'all got to deal with me two weekends out of three years? I was there for five months. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night, I was there. I preached. I started making up stuff. After five months, I was just making up stuff. I ain't having nothing else to preach. But Jesse, I watched. I, I, I watched as this family... There was this family that, man, they were, they were great. They were spiritual. They were doing great things. And I didn't know that literally on the exact opposite side of the building was another part of the family, was some cousins or something. They were another part of the family. I did not know that this side, that, that, that the kids of this side couldn't stand the kids from that side. Their excuse is they're too carnal. So y'all get to be the spiritual people, okay? They're too carnal. They're not really invested. They're not really the friend. Well, over time, they, they started following my wife on social media, and we all got, and kind of got connected. And it, it was in one day, one week, they griped about how carnal they were. And in one week, I know I'm going I'm to mess with some of y'all's sacred cow here when I talk about worldly music because we don't preach it. It's not that big a deal anymore, apparently. In one week, one day, Dosha, I watched. One day. I watched this this young person who claimed to be super spiritual and couldn't hang out with that side of the church because they were just too carnal. Started posting videos at the Garth Brooks concert. And I thought, that's odd. That don't make no sense. I mean, if you're going to go, don't put it all over social media. Be a good old kind of sinner and just don't brag about it. (laughs) And then... 20 minutes later or so, I seen another video from the Carnal family that posted videos from the Garth Brooks concert. Now, they were too spiritual to hang out with this side, but yet their interests were the same. What it amounted to is that side had something in their, in, their, in their saddle. They had a burr in their saddle. They couldn't get over this one. And they claimed to be more spiritual, but when in reality, when in reality it was that they were just as carnal, they just masked it better. They couldn't hang out with the rest of the youth group because I just don't get along with them, man. I, y'all, y'all are just here, so y'all fixing to deal with this, okay? I just can't hang out with the rest of the youth group because they're just too carnal. And I don't have anything in common with them, and I don't really get along with them anyways. But you ain't got no problem going and hanging out with all the worldly friends that are influencing you negatively. Hey, young men, I just, I don't fit in. I, I just don't do, you know, I don't get into church the way they do. I, I don't get involved the way they do because I just, I don't see the importance of it. But you don't mind staying up till 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning on social media and on gaming systems and, and every, talking on all this networking stuff to all these people. Here, I'm going to give the young people a break. I'm going to talk to some of you parents and some of you adults. You ain't you. ain't I'm just too busy to show up to the block party on Saturday. And we had a good out turnout. I, I'm not taking shots at nobody. I'm just using it because I was here. I'm too busy to show up to the block party on Saturday and pray with people who are standing with their hands lifted, seeking the gift of the Holy Ghost. But you can go and run and gun with everybody. I can't go to ladies' conference with the rest of the group. I ain't got the money, but you got money to go on girls' trips to Nashville. <laughs> I'm just too busy. I, 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 you don't understand, Brother White. I, you're a full-time preacher. You get to sleep in late every day and eat fried chicken all day. I work shift work. So did I. I work shift work and I evangelized for three years. I know what it's like to be tired. But I also know the spiritual condition I got in when I got distracted and started spending more time with the world than I was with the church. Well, we ain't nowhere near my notes right now, but let me just walk this little dog. We got to realize that, yes, we've got to be friendly. We got to have friends that we can't expect to reach them. If we're not, we got to have, we got to show ourselves friendly. We got to reach the world, but don't get it twisted. You should not be more invested in the world than you are your church. Some of them just want to see how far you'll come out. They're not interested in coming. They just want to see how close you'll come to them. You cannot blame it on the church. Don't blame your carnal attitude on the preacher. Don't blame your carnal attitude on the pastor. Your problem is that you're too invested in the world. You're too invested on things that are not spiritual. 
Preacher, you're making a bigger deal out of it than what it really is. Am I? Or are you just ignoring another invitation on a Sunday morning to be a part of the church? Verse 6 tells us the remnant. Oh, help me, Jesus. Verse 6 tells us that the remnant, the rest of the people, the ones that had no farms to go to, the ones that, did, that weren't newly wed, it, it, it was the people. I'm fixing to mess with some of you right here. It was the people that didn't have a farm to go to. They didn't have oxen to tend. They, they had been married for years. The remnant were the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests in this parable. They became the persecutors. They took the servants and they beat them and they killed them. It does not matter who you are. You cannot find a reason that would merit the murder of the messenger at the hands of these people all they had done was extend the invitation to be a part of the church notice Notice with me that it was the people who claimed to know all things spiritual. It was the very ones who claimed to be spiritual leaders of the congregation. They were supposed to be the ones guiding the new converts as to how to do right and live right. But instead they learned to murder the master's messengers. Verse 7 tells us how that when the king heard his servants had been murdered, his anger grew. It is here that we see in Christ's teachings that he's telling the people. I came for my people. I sent messengers to my people, but you would not hear me. I sent men of God, and you ignored their admonishings. I even sent my spirit robed in flesh, and yet it would not be more than a few days, and you'll murder the Messiah. I need you to know I'm growing increasingly angry with the fact that you keep ignoring the invitations to the party. So the king sent his army, and they killed those that murdered the servants. Notice he doesn't send more servants to be murdered. But Christ rises up and his anger is kindled and he sends an army of angels to end them take away everything. You can only ignore the merciful invitations of the Almighty for so long before the king starts taking it personal. The king was angry that they ignored bidding to come to the marriage feast. It is understandable that the king would be furious. His invitations had been ignored. His grace to them had been abused. And abused mercy will soon be the worst kind of anger. Here's what bothers me as a man of God. Here's what scares me as an evangelist that is invested and loves this congregation. The very ones who seem important enough to be invited seem to care the least. They didn't seem to care that they were forfeiting their place at the table. It didn't seem to bother them that they were passing on the feast of all feasts. The grace that was being shown was greater than anything anybody else could ever give them. And that's why we see the harsh realization that grace despised is grace forfeited. You see, it was more than just a bad time for those people to come to the party. It was more than just a simple scheduling conflict. No, the master was offering them a marriage celebration like they had never seen before. They had not experienced things on such a level that would come to them at the feast. And had they just accepted the invitation, but they just simply ignored an invitation to be a part of the church. I find it haunting to see that it wasn't those that that went back to their farms that murdered the servants. No, it wasn't the storekeepers that found it easy to murder the preacher in their life. Ironically, it was the ones that had nothing better to do with their time than to kill the preacher. Yeah, idle people had nothing better to do than to find things wrong with the party. They'll get mad because the playlist isn't to their liking. They'll find a way to be upset because their name wasn't printed on the, on the program. It wasn't embossed in gold letters on the program. They'll be upset because they weren't allowed to be friends with the ministry. They find it easy to ignore the invitation because they had idle hands and idle minds. They find it easy to ignore because they have nothing better to do than to find fault with the preacher. You have nothing better to do with your life than to find fault with the church. They find fault with everybody that's it. it was the ones that had all the time in the world to accept the invite. It was the saved ones. It was the spiritual people. It was the people that were supposed to be spiritual guides within the congregation. After all, they were the remnant. They were the ones that should have known exactly how the process worked. They knew what to wear. They knew how to act. They knew how to dance. They knew how to sing the certain songs. They knew how to write motions. And they knew how to do the right gestures. 
but instead they had grown so accustomed to ignoring the invitation of the master to come into covenant and commitment that it was easier to silence the voice of the messenger than it was to prepare themselves for the ceremony. The Bible says that the army slaughtered those who had murdered the servants, but it also says that those armies burn up the entire city. You know what that lets me know, preacher? Let me know that they had no more excuses. It's real quiet right now, and I'm not sure if I'm confident or just disturbed. I, 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 this did not happen to me. I was only witness to it. But I remember as a teenager, I remember as a young preacher in our church, there was a family that, that had prayed and begged God for a baby. They had begged God to give them a child. And God did. Man, God gave them. It was, it was an incredible miracle, unbelievable miracle. I mean, it, it, doctors said it ain't never going to happen. All the tests said it's never going to happen. And, and then out of nowhere, poof, after prayer and after some fasting, boom, they're pregnant. But it wasn't long that mom and dad quit praying so hard about having a baby until they completely quit praying at all. And then it was, well, the baby's sick, so we got to stay home tonight. That was one of the sickest kids I'd ever heard of in my life. Every Sunday morning, it had another croup of something. Every midweek, it was, well, it caught something at school, and it went on for years. And God sent message after message after message. And God sent preacher after preacher after preacher. And God tried his best to get their attention. And he tried his best to warn them. And eventually they just kept ignoring the invitations to get things right until eventually the baby did get sick. And eventually they couldn't come to church because they were in the hospital with treatments nonstop. And yet the invitations kept being ignored. Until eventually God just come down and took that promise back. And now there was no more excuses. They, they, much like the armies went in and they burnt down the entire, they, bor- they burnt down the storekeeper's shop. They burnt the fields and now the farmer no longer had a farm to go tend to because it was all a bunch of rubble. The young married couple, they, they, they needed God now. They needed a place to go because they, they didn't have a new home that they had built themselves. In other words, God got so fed up with ignored invitations that he went and said, okay, I'll just take away all of your excuses. You hear me today. I realize I'm preaching to a small faction of people, but I am preaching and I am trying to shift the culture of this church back. We talked about it this morning, Pastor. We we, we talked in the office after the dream that I told you I had. I'm going to tell you what I felt in the Holy Ghost. There are some young people. There are some. Caleb, you hear me. Cody, you hear me in the Holy Ghost. You were kids when I was here and I was talking about the revival we used to have 15 years ago. You were just baby. You were just, you were younger than my kids. And, and, And you weren't really a part of it, but you watched it. And that's why some of you are so hungry for that same intensity and you want that move of God and you want to have revival. You want to go back to multiple weeks of revival. You want to go back to just seeing God wreck this place and and quit worrying about making sure babies get to bed on time. I realize, hey, we're a big part of it. We got kids that have got to go. I'm not talking about being irreverent. I'm not talking about not respecting your time. But at whatever point a bedtime becomes more important than your kid being saved. At whatever time your job becomes more important than making sure your soul is saved. You are ignoring an invitation of the Almighty. And so God said, I'm not going to send another preacher into their midst to be murdered. I'm not sending another messenger into their world so that they can ignore him too and so that they can tear him down. The Bible says that the army slaughtered all those that murdered. But it also says that those same armies burn up the entire city. They didn't have anything. Left. Can I just preach today? Can, can I just be real blunt? Do, do, do yourself a favor. Do your pastor a favor and quit saying that you're a part of this church. Quit lying to yourself. Quit lying to people and saying you're a part of this church. Quit saying you belong to the church. Because the sad reality for some of you is that you aren't a part of the church. You just attend. You're no more involved than anybody else. Sadly, if we would go back and look at the records, and I'm sure you have them, if we went back and look at we have guests that are more faithful than some of our saints. You do less than a guest. 
Because they at least show up every Sunday and every Wednesday. You're no more involved in any departments than anybody else. Quit saying that you're a part of the church. Why don't we see you on off-night revivals? Why don't we see you when we're trying to have fellowships? Why don't we see you at work days? Why don't we see you at block parties? Don't say you're a part of the church if we have to beg you to get involved in worship service. Don't say you're a part of the church if the preacher has to worry that his message is not going to be revelatory enough. If your pastor has to wonder how you're going to attack him this time. You aren't a part of the church. This is just the church you attend. I find it disturbing the amount of people that are so involved in things around our world. Hey, I, I, I am all about this Asbury revival. I'm all about it. I think it's great. I think God is awakening things across our nation. God is moving across our nation. But it disturbs me how many people that I personally know that are not in ministry. It disturbs me how many people who will post about it and will share it and will talk about it. But when it comes time to being a part of our church, we can't find it with in our efforts. Oh, oh, that we would go to prayer and rather than just publicly declaring it, what if we would start focusing on our own church? What if we would start reaching our own city? What if we would start reaching our neighbors? Oh. Oh. I'm not speaking against it in any way. I love it. I believe it. I wish there was more revivals across our country. I wish that we would go to every community college in this entire area and start a preaching point. But if you are in awe of the fact that revival has gone on for weeks now, then don't miss another church service here on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night. If you are in awe of the worship that doesn't have the music and it doesn't have the constant things going, stop forcing the worship team into cheerleading you into participating. If you are blown away by the sense of love and belonging, start reaching. Start loving. Start putting your hands to work. Start winning your local community that is lost and broken and searching. Something is wrong when we can spend hours following and we can spend hours watching and posting about other revivals, but we don't even stop long enough to attend our own. Something's wrong. Something's wrong, Adam, when we can talk about it everywhere. But we can't even stop criticizing our own move of God. We can talk about the big name preacher that all the other churches have. But we can't quit criticizing the move of God we have right here in Iuka. There needs to be something. I'm trying to, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm trying to grip your heart. We're going to have church tonight. You hear me? I, I said it last night. We're going to have church tonight. We're going to throw down, have some apostolic swing from the chandeliers kind of church tonight. But today, God's got to get a commitment from some people. You've been teetering on the edge of maybe I will, maybe I won't. There needs to be something that comes alive within us and recognizes the blessing of being a part of the church. There is a joy that comes with being a part of the church. John 5 and 37 says, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom hath sent him? Him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you may. It's not just about God coming to us. We've got to go to him. Those that will end up lost forever will have an eternal misery of ignored invitations. Can I just be honest with you today? I'm not preaching to people that are lost and a million miles away from God. I'm not just preaching to people that are just a million miles and never heard about God. But I'm preaching to saints that sit on our pew on nearly every weekend. But you won't come to a midweek. I'm talking to people that are here and yet you give options to your kids that you know are going to lead them to a detrimental end. You won't live it because you know they're going to ask you to be involved and you're not sure you're ready to commit to it. Can I tell you the greatest tragedy? Can I tell you the greatest torment of hell will not be the addiction. It will not be the sin. The greatest torment that you will experience in hell is every time you ignored an invitation to be a part of the body of Christ. 
Every time you ignored the invitation to have peace in your home again. Every time you ignored the invitation to experience grace and mercy. But it was their own decision to ignore the invitation sent by the messenger after messenger after messenger. How many times have I preached to this congregation? How many times has your pastor stood in this pulpit and preached similar messages? And yet you didn't do anything but ignore the invitation. And yet you wonder why your family is lost. You wonder why there's no peace in the home. You wonder why things are falling apart and you can't keep a steady job in. Could it be that God's coming in and disturbing things in your world? Because you keep ignoring. Some of you said, I, I want to live for God and I want to be a part of the church and I want to be sold out to this thing. I realize I'm preaching. I won't preach this long tonight. I know. I know that's the typical preacher cliche, but I won't preach this long tonight. You hear me in the Holy Ghost. I'm trying to reach somebody's heart right now. I know you're just saying, well, there's just too many questions and, and, and I'm not sure I understand why that church does everything they do, but there's something inside of you that wants to be a part of it, but the world is pulled on you. Well, I'm just not sure I'm ready to be sold out. I don't look like everybody else and I don't understand and everything. Hey, can I tell you, you don't have to look like us to be a part of the family. You don't have to understand everything to be a part of the family, but you've been feeling hunger, and you've been feeling the Spirit of God draw you and pull you. That's the invitation. Today, I am extending yet another invitation to reach you and tell you that you need to be a part of the church. And I don't mean just show up so that you can punch the time clock. I mean be the church. Brother Brian, Sister Christy, I love you guys so much. You are some of my favorite people in the entire world. Your daddy gave me a Christmas stocking before I was married. It's a general sleeve thing because he knew I loved the Civil War. He gave it to me somewhere right here in the old building by the second pew is where he gave it to me. I still got it. I still put it up every Christmas. You all mean the world to me. But you want to know some of the greatest days Ayuka ever had? was when you didn't have quite as much gray hair. And I remember your boys dancing and screaming, and I remember the youngest one coming up, and he would always worship right beside me. He wanted to stand right beside me all the time. I remember your boy always wanting to be around. He loved my orange car. and he loved, the, the, I'm not saying that, that, that our greatest days are behind us. I'm saying that God is trying to turn the hunger of this church back to days like that. I remember them. I remember these two red-headed snotty boys that just wore you smooth out. You could not get them to pay attention in church. Well, Caleb wouldn't, but Cody, he's always been a good kid. Well, let me tell you what it's time for, boys. Come here, Caleb. Come help me. You knew you, knew you wasn't getting away with revival for me not picking on you. Come on, Bubba. Get a hold of me. What we need to do. <laughs> Mom and Daddy, they're not old by any means, but they got some years on them. It's not, their, it's not their job to facilitate revival for your generation. It's not mom and dad's, not granny and grandpa's job to facilitate unity. It's not their job to facilitate a move of God. It's not their job to financially support revival in the church. But when this generation links together and says, I want a move of God, I'm not ignoring another invitation. Come on, Jesse. Come on, Ryan. Link in with this thing. I got to have a move of God. I got to have. Re- You want me to tell you what needs to happen? We need some people that will bind together and say, I'm tired of waiting on everybody else to do it. I'm tired of waiting on mom and dad to do it. We're a part of the church. We're a part of the body of Christ. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get with your husband. Come on. Husbands, come on. Get up here. Come on, Lance. Come on. Get over here. Get over here. Come on, link up with your husband right now. Come on. We've been waiting on Bishop and Sister Lambert to do it. We've been waiting on Mom and Dad to do it. But we got to be hungry for a move of God. we got to be hungry for revival. It's not everybody else's job. It's not everybody. 
Your greatest days are not behind you. You need to be a part of the church. You need to buy into this thing and be a part of the body. Come on, I'm not begging anybody to come to an altar today. I'm not begging anybody because I don't want to beg you. I want you to accept an invitation. Come on, mom and dad. Come on, parents. Why don't you come down and find your adult kids? Why don't you come down and find this married couple? Find your grandbabies and pray that same passion and pray the same prayers. Blake, the same thing that kept you in this thing, the same thing that brought revival joy. Pray it on those girls. Pray it on these babies. Come on, you're lonely. You're tired of feeling disconnected. You're tired of feeling like you don't belong. You're tired of feeling like you don't know where to turn. This is where you belong. Can I talk to somebody? This is where you belong. Quit letting the devil tell you you don't fit in. Quit letting the adversary tell you you don't belong. You belong here. It's an invitation. Come on, there ought not be one young person praying by themselves. There ought not be one person in this building that is praying alone. You belong to the church. You belong to the body. You belong here. Come on, young people. Come on, young adults. Get a hunger for this thing. Fall in love with this thing. I'm going to fall in love with the church. I'm going to fall in love with living for God. Youth director's not going to have to worry about where I am. Pastor and Sister Lambert aren't going to have to worry whether or not I'm going to be faithful, whether or not I'm going to be involved, whether or not I'm going to show up. No, I'm a part of the church. I'm a part of the body of Christ. I want revival. I want revival. Come on, young adults. Come on, young adults. Come on, young married couples. I want revival. If we got to stay here till midnight, I want revival. If I got to worry, if I got to be tired at work the next day, a move of God is more important. If I got to extend myself, if I've got to spend and be spent, I want to be a part of the church.
Come on. Eliminate some options. Eliminate the options. Sin is not our problem. Options are our problem. Sin is not our issue. Too many options is our issue. I can if I want to, but if I don't feel like it, I am mom and dad ain't going to make me. Hey, mom and dad, take away the options. Take away the option. We are going to be in church. We are going to be faithful. You are going to be involved. It's available. Pray for somebody close to you right now. Come on, pray for them. God's doing tremendous things in this house.
Thank you so much for your help. Pray for somebody close to you. If you're through praying for them, find you somebody else to pray for. That's okay.
many are transitioning here and there. We'll stop a moment, lift our hands, and thank God for a moment in His presence today. He would take the time to send an invitation. An invitation for you to be a part. An invitation for you to be a part of the family. An invitation for you to dine at the table. An invitation for you to live within protection. Blessings of the Lord in your life. Somebody ought to lift your hands and say, God, I am a blessed individual today. I have an invitation. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for an invitation. Hallelujah. But I must ask who today is going to do something with the invitation. More than just having an invitation, who's going to do something with the invitation today? Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I'm sure thankful today. Touch of the Holy Ghost in this house. So appreciative. All of you who've been a part of this service today, to our guests, thank you for being here this morning. Pray the Lord touches and ministers to your heart. This time, Brother Tarazas is coming. We've got a few things to take care of. I think classes are coming. Just a few check on those classes that are coming right now. And, uh, I do want to say my great appreciation again to each of you who were a part of block party yesterday. It's been mentioned a couple of times. And with that, thank you all for your efforts and your involvement there. I do want to say that there were definite positive connections made yesterday uh, with folks in the community, new folks, and uh, they look forward to us being there and being a part of that activity yesterday. And uh, with that, there were backsliders that were there and we're thankful that God touched and ministered to their heart and their drawing. God is sending an invitation to them even this morning. God bless you, Brother Tarazas, as you come right now. I sure love and appreciate you, sir. Happy <coughs> birthday, anniversaries. Introduction. We didn't have any anniversaries on the calendar, so if it was your anniversary and we missed it, just, just let us know. Um, and we have Brother Lee Shields, who celebrated a birthday this week. I don't think he's up here. And little Adley Blake also celebrated a birthday. So make sure you get with me after service. I left him down there, and I got the little cards to get you free coffee. Well, not her. She doesn't need coffee. Praise the Lord. Happy birthday. Feliz cumpleaños. Pre-service prayer uh, tonight will start at 5.30 in the sanctuary. It will transition into service at 6 p.m. Easter Sunday is next Sunday. Wow, already. April the 9th. Please invite someone to be with us. Coming up on April the 15th will be the wedding of Brother Drew and Sister Amber. And it will be here at the church at 4 p.m. Please find... Well, we have the kids. Be still and the I am God. Psalm, Psalm 46, Sam. Bella.
Down in my heart. Yeah, down, down in my, in my heart. heart. Got, got the joy, 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 joy. Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Jesus. I think I've got a few microphones in my hand. Amen. <laughs> this is not the church of tomorrow, folks. I think I'll say that again. This is not the church of tomorrow. <laughs> I feel the same way sometimes. Amen. If you would stand right now, we want to have a, a little while of fellowship. You will make sure and let Brother Nathaniel White know that we are glad to have him in service this morning. Uh, I got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Joy, joy down in my heart. Wish I had folks like that to just threw their self down. I didn't get to sing. I